Hello guys, this is uh, Dr. Pallay Manikam. In this video, we're going to talk about what is going to happen with COVID infection in kids. And uh, everybody's talking about the third wave and uh, we have had a recording session in the past with a pediatrician and then you guys asked me to follow up on that with more questions as well. So I thought it would be a better idea to bring in pediatricians from all over the world. So one good thing that we have is we, are clo we have a closely knit batch uh, from PhD Medical College, Coimbatore. And um, fortunately, everybody has uh, been settled in uh, different parts of the world. And I thought we can pull in their experience together and we'll talk about what is happening with COVID in different parts of the world and kids, what should be worried about. And as a parent, should we have to worry about the third wave? And more importantly, when is the vaccines coming and how are we going to protect our kids? We have a wonderful uh, session uh, waiting for you and uh, we will uh, keep you posted with all the questions, okay? how this session is going to happen is i'll be the layman person about pediatrics which is true i don't know anything about other than gi um, these days and it's going to be a very casual conversation so i'm going to ask you a question from uh, what i need to know uh, for my four-year-old and my two-year-old okay so that is what is going to happen and i'm going to spread the questions across uh, all three of you so the first question is uh, let me start with uh, Kritiha. So mm -hmm. what is going on with COVID infection in US and kids? What, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? What is going on? So I think as far as COVID in kids in the US, you know, initially when we had the first uh, primary um, COVID infection, we didn't really see a lot of COVID. Uh, we saw like an inflammatory response sometimes that is a little bit delayed, but um, COVID was primarily just asymptomatic, which means mm -hmm. that kids just got it from their parents, but didn't really come into the ER, come into the hospital with any of, um, um, anything serious. With the second wave, we started to see a lot more of um, the COVID symptoms in kids. So more like vomiting, diarrhea, kids that needed like IV fluids, uh, a lot of them with dehydration. And now we are starting to see more respiratory symptoms as well, um, where they have some shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Um, but yes, that's that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, so compared to before, the presentation is severe. Is that what you're it saying? It has changed. It's, I, I would not call it severe. I mean, we saw a lot more Miss C. That is that inflammatory response that we, you know, um, we see sometimes in kids, and that was very severe. Um, mm. What we're seeing as far as COVID in kids is still rare, um, but uh, you're seeing more of a response to the primary infection now as opposed to previously. Okay, let me ask you this. Let's say or, or, let's say you see 10 patients in a day and then come back, give me a number about how many patients you're seeing before and now. With COVID. Uh, out of 10 normal patients, how many patients are COVID? So at the peak, we used to see at least like four or five patients. Now I'm seeing maybe one or two. So it one has more. definitely come down. Yes. Okay. Uh, but you are an inpatient pediatrician, which means mm -hmm. that they will come to the hospital only when they're sick. Uh, exactly. That's right. So the, the ones that are like self-isolating or the ones that have very minor symptoms are just not, you know, they are not on my radar at all. Um, and I mean, uh, uh, that is the same concept of what we, what have been uh, thinking about about COVID and kids throughout, right? Like, you know, it's been majority of the infections are mild and majority of them are like treated as an outpatient. What is your experience in UK? In the UK, it's pretty much what um, similar to what Kriti has said. Um, in the first instance, it used to be very less because it was the adult population that was affected more. Uh, there are a lot of studies that are coming out there is a recovery trial that's under that's coming uh, in the UK, which they are doing uh, based on different uh, number of people who've had COVID and what their outcome is, treatment modalities, lots of things they're looking at. In children specifically, what uh, the RCPCS, the Royal College, have uh, they've brought out some guidelines and uh, in relation to the um, inflammatory. Uh, responses as well. What they say is that children predominantly they come out with three types of uh, illnesses related mm -hmm. to COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these are usually associated with fever. Uh, the three types, what they mention is first they have uh, a cough coriza kind of respiratory kind of presentation or they can have a second type where they have a gastrointestinal or they can have rash kind of presentation 
or the third type this is the neurological type where they can have associated seizures um, and uh, other uh, neurological deficits kind of thing so they have defined it in those three categories but all in all the numbers are not as much as they are in the adult population obviously with the delta variant coming in the cases caseload went up but with the vaccination catching up we are hoping that that caseload starts to come down soon uh, obviously the schools have now reopened being september mm. uh, so we are yet to see what will happen opening of schools i think there's only one big advantage is that you know we don't have to deal with the kids 24/7 at home <laughs> <laughs> but anyways coming to subhashini uh, tell me what's going on in chennai and what's going on general in india covid situation um looks like my when i asked my mom my mom was like covid what is that that's a virus that was around around in around april yeah <laughs> yeah the scenes in us and uk is different and india is entirely different yeah we are in we are, you are all in the mid of the uh, third wave but in india we see still the second wave is not come to a control or it is not declined to a level where you can see an imminent third wave mm. and uh, people are predicting about there are a lot of models which have come out when the third wave will occur mm. and most of us believe that the third wave would occur probably by the mid of october or november mm-hmm. is what is predicted as of now and uh, the vaccinations are also catching up so we should see some cases which are in the mild category as we see in the us and the uk and the fatality has been low in those in the west as well when there was a vaccination coverage the same should be continuing here as well because as far as chennai is concerned we have seen like almost like uh, 40 lakhs of the 60 lakh population have been vaccinated now no oh, nice nice yeah. so mm. that's uh, the that too with the first dose and uh, we are they are catching up on the vaccinations and they have opened up in all malls and marketplaces and wherever you see you can see vaccination happening everywhere nice and with the vaccination picking up i think third wave should be a cake walk for us um and every parent is really anxious and i'm getting so many emails all over the world that you know as a parent what can be done or how should we just reassure ourselves that you know what things are going to be okay i i just don't know even i was i'm in that boat as well you know sometimes uh, i get anxious as well you know what will happen if my kid gets covid so uh, what is your take on and what do you tell your patients about see uh Naveen and Pratiha, both of them had mentioned about the risk of misc and what the complications can be there and what are the warning signs. Mm. So, and we also see that the risk is very much less. Where compared to adults, the risk is very very low. And if you see the case fatality also with regards to children, it is almost like 0.3 percent when compared to adults, where we see more than 3 percent sometimes. And now it has come down to 1 percent. Mm. so the case fatality is very low as you said if you say it's that one child could be my child then that uh, anxiety is going to grow mm. Mm. but i'm just going to play a devil's advocate here um, you guys really think that there'll be social distancing so i mean i can only speak from my experience last year my mm. daughter um, you know we had the lockdown in spring last year right in the us and of course we were all remote um when september comes around my daughter says i am not staying home anymore <laughs> this is a 7 year old right it's not like she's a teen or anything like that right oh. um she and i just did not like yeah see eye to eye um mm. and so she said she wants to go back and i was i was not happy about it at all um but i have to say my school district did a phenomenal job um they did do a, a social distancing they had um the hybrid model where you know they went to school like a couple of days a week and then stayed home and so on the days that they were at school um because it was only 50% of children they were able to put their desks apart they ate lunches at their desks so there was no um and they were masking even outside so no mask breaks nothing like they did a great job mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. now i think i think that that's that's one of the most important point out of the discussion is where you weigh the risk and the benefits the benefits is much more higher in sending your kid to school compared to the risk of getting a cold and i mean i think it's also community transmission right so if you live in a school district where the community transmission is very high and the the um, the unvaccinated population is also yes. high then yes. 
then you should you should not do it yes you should uh, stay back mm. yes like everybody is supposed to be an epidemiologist now it's uh, right right <laughs> Yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, uh, so, let me let me ask. Let me. So, what, what do you teach? You you have a four. You know what I say? Inja ara. Naal naal ba naal. So, so I mean, you have a four-year-old. Uh, what do you teach uh, your four-year-old? How do you uh, make them hand wash? And what are the techniques that you use? Yeah, I think uh, she is much more uh, uh, smart at keeping uh, her hygiene and hand wash techniques than we are sometimes and she sometimes reminds us what to do especially when we go into a shop or something now uh, she knows that once we come back home from anywhere we need to wash our hands and she knows um, i mean although she's not uh, required to wear a mask um, she makes sure that we have our masks on and even when going into a shop there's usually a hand sanitizer at the door so we make sure we use that if you're using a shopping cart we uh, she tells me to clean um the shopping they, cart they, the way that you're explaining looks like your kid is like a baby's day out to kid <laughs> <laughs> one thing But, i can do is i can send my kid to your home and you train him and then you send back to me <laughs> i wish it was me training it but it's not me it's my wife oh good <laughs> so one of my uh, in a social bubble one of the my kid is one of my friends kid is positive for covid and what should we do and what should they do and how that is affecting the social bubble mental health of the child see when it comes to mental health of the child when you know that the child's friend is positive like or your friend's kid maybe your, your child's kid child's friend as well so child might be having some feelings or thoughts about it as well as we mm. do process certain things they will also have an understanding of what is happening around mm. so first you have to allow the child to communicate mm. so rather than we going and bombarding with what we know <laughs> so child should open up and speak to us uh. so many times child will not speak because mm. they're scared that they'll be judged or they may not be heard so their feelings may not be addressed so they should be allowed to communicate their feelings and if they do communicate their feelings or if they say that they are scared or worried or anxious do validate their feelings rather than telling no just leave it away just don't think like that so don't shy away those questions answer their questions whatever questions they have in their mind regarding the illness or maybe put it in simple terms sometimes there will be a different temperament with every child so every child is not the same so according to the age and according to the temperament of the child you can put in simple words an answer to what is only asked and also allow them to communicate and allow them to open up and validate their feelings it's okay to be upset that's how everyone feels when you are going through these things and i am in this along with you. if it's a younger child you have to support the child and say that the parent is there for you all the time and we'll do it together mm. it's an old child, you have to describe the health plan and what are you planning to do for the child which helps the child to have an idea that they are not in a very helpless situation and there is no control over things and sometimes child may be worried about their friend as well mm. Mm. So you address that as well and you have to connect with them and make the child talk to that person as well and you can also put in simple terms if the child is worried what if i am infected what if i am uh, not taken care so you can you can brief about the health care plan and make them aware of what is happening so that they feel comfortable and secure so and involve them involve them the one thing i want to tell when you think that your child's friend is positive and uh, you're taking care of the child first you should calm down so that brings mm. a lot of comfort in your child the child knows that you are uh, confident and uh, you know what you're doing so mm. that put in our face and in our uh thinking as well so that will provide a lot of comfort to your child as well adavad bayatha vandu mogathla kaamikapadadu bayame irukka koodadhu bayame but my question to you guys is the 0 to 12 years of age right that first 12 years vaccines are in progress we will get approved in the next two or three months um will you should we have to actually take it my take on this is because the risk is extremely low in this group of population um can i argue that hey you know what maybe vaccination is not needed for this group of population what is your take on that kritya 
Okay, I I don't know if I'm going to have like a controversial take on it, but I <laughs> um, I will argue for vaccinations, right? Mm. I mean, I, uh, um, I I yeah, I think we should do vaccinations, and the reason being that it helps with a lot of things. So not only for the kids, but it helps with like community transmission, keeping schools open, um, keeping businesses open. So from all of those perspectives, we've shown that kids are actually bigger spreaders of COVID, even though they don't have as many symptoms. Um, so it's it's not that children are not getting COVID or that they're not passing it on. They definitely are. So we need to, if we need to cut transmission, that is like the biggest reservoir that we have to tackle. Um, mm. So I will definitely argue for it. In fact, my sister-in-law um, son just turned 12 yesterday. And mm. so he was asking me, should I get him vaccinated? And I said, yes, absolutely. Um, well, you, should have, you should have asked them to see my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then, yes, we should. And uh, like you said, the risk of uh, myocarditis, and they have proven this, is that it, there's no change compared to the general population. Um, and so, it is. So if it was your kid between zero to twelve, which you are, you have an eight-year-old. So if the vaccine is available, you will get that in a heartbeat. I will get it. Yes. Super. Sounds good. Beautiful. How about Naveen? Naveen, let me ask you this. So um, let's say that you are a four-year-old, and then the vaccine is available. Um, what do you tell? to the uh, parents who don't, uh, how should I put this? Um, like the long-term complications. I mean, you know, the argument is that, you know, you don't know about the long-term risk of these vaccines in these young kids. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there is still scientific data that's, uh, on, I mean, not yet out for that. Mm. Um, the current NHS guidelines, I mean, we have to go by what the NHS big ha uh, advises us. They have a scientific committee on that. and they advise vaccination for every child about the age i mean 16 and above mm -hmm. and they have an additional vaccination given to children between the ages of 12 to 15 who are in the high risk category who have other conditions heart conditions or lung conditions that can uh, have uh, a worse uh, outcome if they are they have covid mm -hmm. so right now they don't advise vaccination for everybody within that age group 12 to 15 only the high risk one. Oh, is that right okay so only 12 to 15 only high risk only high risk mm -hmm. ones but, but yeah, like you said in the near future there will be uh some guidance on that and it is likely that they will advise vaccination for lesser and younger children mm -hmm. um uh, so i will have to say that i will have to wait for the scientific evidence to say or go for or against because to be frank i would rather at this point, without evidence, have a knowledge of my daughter's antibody status rather than um, give a vaccine. But mm. obviously, scientific evidence tells me otherwise. I will follow that. I think that is a there's a major problem. And if if it was me, I think I would also vaccinate my kid, um, regardless of the status, just because of that mental reassurance that okay, you know what, we have something. But uh, but I'm also taking a risk that you know we don't have a long term safety data. Right. Uh, but at this time, the risk and benefits, in my opinion, benefits is slightly outweighing the risk, especially in this group of population. But they can argue also that the risk is extremely low. So um, it can go either ways. That's kind of a discussion. So coming to Subhashini, um, I'll tell you the situation here in US, right? So 50% of people are unvaccinated. And that is the whole reason that my hospital is completely filled with COVID. Uh, for, to a, such an extent that there is a guy who is having a board outside my hospital. It says, vaccine is a hoax, vaccine is a fake. Uh, and then all the doctors are standing in line looking at him. And he's asking me, doctor, you can put a board in. And I said, hey, I'm not sure. That brings to the next important point to Subhashini as your closing point is um, social media and uh, watching TV and screen time and kids, especially in this pandemic, right? Yeah. My son uh, screams if I switch uh, if I switch off the Coco Melon. Coco Melon is a YouTube channel over here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. As well. yeah. yeah. I mean, he knows everything, but he doesn't know my name, but he knows the Coco Melon character. Um, so. I'm pretty sure you deal with this all the time. What is the suggestion for my audience for that? Yeah, uh, screen time has become a major problem now because of online schooling, and uh, there's there's nothing to connect with. The child doesn't know where what to do at that time. That is a main problem now. 
so when you're dealing with the screen time when you think your child is doing too much of uh, on screen activities and you want to limit the time and you can give the child uh, if it's an older child you can give a timer or they can time their activities there are apps where you can time uh, record how much time you have used for education how much time you have used for entertainment or social media and they just they can just maintain a record you just don't have to go and advise this is what you have to do mm-hmm. and uh, and after that you can make them observe that record and ask them questions like is this what you want to know is this what you what you want to do in uh, is this what you were planned to and uh, you can also put in some points like there are evidences that suggest that if you are using screen for a longer time that there can be some attention deficits or social skills can be getting affected is this what you want in your life or is this what you are looking for the child make the child think for themselves give them mm-hmm. a sense of mm-hmm. go and control the child and especially in teens if you're working like that and it can turn otherwise the child will not get controlled maybe the behavior will become twice of what they are doing now mm. so so work collaboratively take time be patient be consistent and uh, let the child make the, let the child realize and then the child make the change when the child is bringing that time off the screen then you have to think about you have to ask one question what are you planning for the child otherwise So, mm. so that is one thing which you can you have to make a plan and you have to be ready with you can work with the child or whatever the, their hobbies were where they or their interests or develop a new hobby in a child so that uh, they are off the screen and they are not getting bored i think the alternate alternative plan is extremely important i switch off the tv and this guy cries right away i have to figure out something else and then switch off the tv mm okay super super guys thank you thank you so much for your wonderful time i was been wonderful meeting all of you after a long time as well and then uh, providing wonderful information from all over the world thank you again thank you for uh, joining for a wonderful session thank, thank you, you for inviting us as well yeah.